Hello and welcome to the Make Ideas Reality Podcast. I'm Justin White, aka The Garage Avenger. If someone offers you an amazing opportunity to do something and you don't know how to do it, say yes, then learn how to do it later. That's a quote from billionaire Sir Richard Branson, who is a big advocate for saying yes over no, as he believes opportunity favors the bold. So often we are afraid to say yes, we fear failure. We anticipate the worst, especially when we don't know what to expect. By saying no to opportunities, we reject many of life's serendipitous moments that often disguise themselves in a new career prospect or an opportunity to meet someone or change in direction or even a random DM on Instagram asking if you want to be a guest on a podcast. That is exactly how I got today's guest on the show. Today, I'll be talking with the infamous Jimmy DeResta, who is known for kind of saying yes to most opportunities. He tells us where this philosophy came from. We discuss his biggest breaks that have come from saying yes, along with the worst thing that could possibly happen when saying yes. Jimmy talks about where he draws the line and says no and how he balances time with partner Taylor between all his other commitments. We've all heard Jimmy on a thousand other podcasts answering all the same questions. So I hope in this episode, you'll hear a side of Jimmy you haven't heard before. So let's get into it. Should I go now? I'm, I'm going to go now. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> go. <laughs> Are you ready for your cringeworthy intro? Go for it. All right, here we go. They call him the godfather of making, but let there be no mistaking. He'll never leave a dead horse's head. Just positivity and passion for making in your bed. Welcome to the show, the one and only Jimmy DeResta. Oh my God, that was awesome. <laughs> Thanks for having me, dude. I, I really appreciate it. I've been listening to you for a bit and I, I really love your take and your, your point of view on many things. So thanks for having me. Yeah, look, you know, I said earlier that, you know, I, I've said this in the past that I, I never really wanted you to, to be on my show because you'd been on a thousand shows before. All right. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I kind of got to kick up the ass from you because you mentioned me on the Making It podcast that you, you like the show. And I thought, mm. oh, man, like he's he's been so nice. <laughs> to talk about my show like maybe maybe there was something actually good from this show and, and I had to think back and I looked at all the guests and I look at all the 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 growth I had in the show and I thought I gotta stop why did, why did you stop just family and life or was there a particular reason well you know like this podcast I do it properly and so often I do a lot of research for the guests yeah, that are not did. for the guests that are not really well known I often sure. do an hour and a half sort of chat sort of a, a week before the recording and we find a topic to talk about. And so that takes time. And then I write up the formats and yeah, the list goes yeah. on it. I was using about 15 hours a week and yeah. I was producing it every week. So, you know, it was, yeah. it was tiring and, and day job. It showed, yeah. honestly, it showed that you definitely are thorough and, you know, you really cared about it. I mean, be Bob and Dave at that, you know, up to past 300 episodes, we just get together. Like, what do you want to talk about? And then we start talking. And yeah, you know, luckily we have the chemistry where we mostly always come up with something interesting. At least, you know, a few minutes of the show is interesting to talk about. Yeah. But, you know, working alone, I can imagine it's, it's really important to do your homework. You know, like Keith Decent does a good podcast and he, I know he puts a tremendous amount of work into it. Yeah. So, so yeah, I kind of wanted to get back to my roots of making stuff. You know, and, yeah. and you know, I, it took me because of the podcast, it took me a year and a half to finish my voice controlled sofa beer fridge. And, <laughs> you know, and so I thought, I can't sustain this. I need to take a break. It was initially yeah. supposed to be just a six month break. Uh, and I'll just assess it from there. But uh, it became nine months. And, you yeah, know, time goes so quick, right? It's like yeah. crazy. Like when we first met in the lobby in England. That was, was that over, that's gotta be over two years ago. Yeah, it's over two years ago. Wow. It's crazy. And so, like so many things happened in that time, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, COVID pandemic and yeah. you know, the, make, uh, 
the uh, Maker Central has been moved like eight times now. <laughs> I I was just saying to uh, my friend uh, Jürgen Stray, he's a he's a maker here, lives local to me, um, and I was saying like I can't wait because this May it's going to be the biggest maker meetup at Maker Central because oh, I think of every everyone's hungry now yeah. for like a face to face meetup. Yeah, you we know? have here we're hosting here in New York the maker camp and Laura's coming, you know, that Laura's a big name from, from your neighborhood that's coming. Yeah. And uh, so many people are bringing it up. Like I'm getting messages like, Hey, you going to make your camp. I'm like, hey, I live two miles away. I'm definitely going. <laughs> <Yeah. in there." laughs> the guys who are hosting it down the block, they conceived of it and asked me to be the push. And I was like, absolutely. So I'm sort of like the, uh, you know, the queen of the ball and I talk about it and I'm always there. Of course I'll be there the entire time. Yep. And it's turned out to be a really good thing. You know, it's it, what's great is that it's like taking on a life of its own. And like people have called me like, hey, you're going to go. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go. I'm help organizing the thing. But I'm glad that that my name is not 100 percent associated with it, that it's become bigger than, you know, whoever I am. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And, and that just means it's going to hopefully go on for years to come, which is what we're really looking forward to. Yeah, I'm looking forward to actually just meeting people, because unfortunately, you know, when you get stuck in your garage and you don't mm -hmm. see people it's, you sort of drift apart a little bit um yeah. and i'm i'm not the best because i'm i'm so focused on trying to do the work you know? i'm like i'm not the best to be in these group chats and i'm not the best to to be this yeah I, I dabble a little bit you know there's been a few chats that have been going on all year long and i jump in every once in a real long while and i just like the whole time i'm talking i'm like i could be editing because when it's late night and people have the time to sit and chat that's when i edit yeah so you know if i'm even if i'm in a conversation the whole time i'm dabbling on like an edit line just editing with no audio and just so that's really my time to work so i'll be like i'll come and say hi and then it's hard to leave because yeah you, you, you feel so many friends you want to chat to and then yep. you're like oh, i got go. i got shit to do <laughs> um I wanted to ask because there's not many people listening to this that don't know who you are. So I kind of wanted to uh, give the, oh, well, like I said earlier, give my wife a chance to hear who you are. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. she um, she's heard your name a thousand times, but never watched the video, <laughs> never looked at any content. You I just watched from. your wife take a dunk in a cold bath, right? That was your wife. Yeah, that's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um. Well, well my, my name is Jimmy Duresta, and I've been making things. Quite literally, since I can remember, ever since I was a young boy, I mean, I remember the very first time my dad let me use a jigsaw at about the age of seven or eight, you know, like they call them scroll saws now. Uh, and then, you know, shortly thereafter, I was using a bandsaw. So I grew up in my dad's wood shop. My dad was more of a handyman, less of an artist. I, I hate to say that because my dad definitely is an artist, but he's the type of old school artist that wouldn't admit that he was an artist because, <laughs> yeah. you know, that was like a hippie thing. Yeah, my dad was like a, a mate, like a like a carpenter, he was an artist. Yeah, and so you know, I grew up strictly as an artist. I like to think, you know, looking back, I absolutely was nurtured to always make things by my father. And as I grew up in a shop, I just kept developing more and more skills. And I've only ever worked at jobs that required me using my hands. You know, I never had like a job as a paper boy. I never had a job at a restaurant or anything like that. So I'm proud to say that I've only ever been a maker, like literally since the age of like eight or nine years old, seven, eight or nine years old. And I was actually making money in high school and elementary school and middle school using my hands doing, you know, one job or another, you know, whether it be making signs as gifts for people or working at a sign shop that I worked at a sign shop for years. That's where I really developed bandsaw skills and, uh, Life went on. I went into art school and then in art school, I originally was going to be an architect. So in high school, I started architecture school, which was going to be like a pre-college. But when I really decided to go to college, I went for art. So I went to art school uh, for graphic design, which led into three-dimensional illustration and kind of product design. And then I graduated that school of visual arts in New York in 1990. And then I actually became a teacher there in 94. I taught for 24 years. But most of that time from 1990 to 2008, I was in the toy business, designing and developing toys, injection molding, sewing, uh, all types of rotocasting, all types of uh, manufacturing techniques. And obviously marketing was a big part of that. And logo designs was all part of that and packaging designs and, and obviously product development, you know, where it comes to like, you get a product and it's broken, you got to figure out how to like make it better. How do you make it better, cheaper, faster? 
all those type of things, you know, have, I've been trained at that, like kind of in the trenches, like in factories in China, like we'd be sitting around the engineering table doing, what do we do? The first shot's not working. How can, you know, and then they'd look at me like, you're the client, tell us how you want it to be better. Many times I'd be representing a company. There's only a few times where I, it was a few, few years there where I worked, we, my brother and a partner had a business together. We owned the toy company. And um, then uh, working with my other brother, I have two brothers. One was I worked in the toy business with. So that's my brother, Joseph. And then my brother, John, who was out in Hollywood acting and doing TV shows. He quick one day said to me, you want to come and help me shoot a video? I have an idea for a TV show. And it was called Trash to Cash. And we actually, I went out there with my camera, shot the show. And together we were able to sell the concept. I got on TV for my first time in 2002. And then uh, again, just dabbling with cameras and playing with ideas. We sold another idea to HGTV in 2005. And uh, with that show was 28 episodes of a show called Hammered. And then uh, I did various stints on HGTV and DIY network. And then my next big show was in 2010 on the Discovery Channel, where me and my brother would pick garbage and sell it at the flea market, you know, use the garbage as fodder to make stuff. And then when that show was canceled without any notification or without any official like, okay, guys, thanks. We don't like this show or we're not going to do it anymore. Like it, it just faded. Like then the last episode we shot, everybody went their own way and I never spoke to anybody again. Nobody wrote back and said, show's doing great. Show's doing bad. Show's going to be on. You're going to do a commercial. Nothing like zero communication. So out of frustration, I went to YouTube. I started working on YouTube. I'm, and I'm, there, there was a story after that right <laughs> that was it youtube became yeah. the place youtube like is absolutely the dumping ground for every skill i learned up till then 100%. because it's all on me it's like what we what are we going to make this week what, what video are we going to make this week all right let me make a video where i make this leather wallet or this camera case or this shelf or this chair or this let me experiment with welding and you know everything went into it the marketing i learned the package design i learned the, uh, you know, working on your feet, working uh, against a deadline, editing, everything goes into YouTube, especially because it's, you're completely self-reliant. And there's, and there's like almost, th th I'd like to say there's like 80% of the time, there's no collaboration. It's just you. And it's very rewarding because you're just leaning on yourself. And you know, how many times have you asked somebody to do something for you and they don't do it? And you're just like, oh, God, I gotta do it again myself. This time you don't have no expectations because you know it's just you <laughs> it's you you're the one that's editing late at night while you're having a conversation with 10 friends you're the one that's editing i mean i'd go to bed with my girl and like i'd be like hey are you asleep and she's like, ah. <laughs> and then i'm like okay and then i sneak out of the bed and then i go down and edit for another three hours because i don't want to be like that guy that's like you go to bed i'll come up when i'm done editing like i go to bed as if life's normal yeah and then when she's asleep i'm like you know make sure she's dead asleep i get up and i go to work because if she knows i'm going she's like don't go to work come stay in bed you know yeah well you you said earlier that you know you when you ask people things you know they often don't come through no yeah. the biggest the biggest problem and this is a whole subject on its own is people don't finish things no people love starting things but nobody loves finishing things nobody like there's like nobody that i've ever met that likes to finish things i mean of all the people i know in my life that i mean outside my youtube community the people in my personal life there's like three people out of like the hundreds of people I know that finish stuff. And I'm one of those three people. You can I, tell I'm frustrated about this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm frustrated too. My wife asked me to build an annex for her birthday and she had mm. no clue how big a job that was. And and so, you mean annex is like an addition to the home. Yeah. Yeah. Or well, as it's like a separate building, like it's like oh, a, yeah, yeah. a okay. little summer house or what do you want to call it? Right. And yeah. she shack is what lately they've been saying it in the Canada yeah. DIY world. Yeah. Yeah, ex exactly that. And she yeah. had no idea and it's still not finished, but she thinks it's finished. You know, right. yeah, she, <laughs> she, think, has, she has no idea how much work still has to go into it. So yeah, yeah. I, I feel you there, but I mean, uh, going, coming back, I think we're going to talk about saying yes. And, and that kind of ties in a little bit of what you were talking about often people say yes if they don't finish through you say yes and you seem to finish it through absolutely yeah I mean, it's really it's it's almost like an ocd of mine that i have to finish anything and then you know it's funny derek from malden always says to me he goes he's i absolutely because i see you start something and i think to myself he's going to abandon that project and he it, it might take two years it might take three years i come back to it mm. lately i've been abandoning projects that are just kind of pointless 
and they're just kind of time wasters. And I can explain that in a minute, but um, it's really just a matter of me, like looking at how much time I have, how much time I literally have left in life and, you know, where the priorities are. And I'm looking around and I'm just like, okay, I don't need this project. This is really, you know, this isn't the fodder that I thought it was going to be. It's more complicated, you know, so I could talk about that, but you know, when other people are involved, then my responsibility is to myself and somebody else. Yeah. Done. Yeah, because I, I mean, we're, we're going to be talking about yeah, saying yes to things, and and saying yes often opens up uh, new challenges and and opportunities. And if you seem to wait and, and until you're ready, often that opportunity is you know passed you by. And saying yes means that you are often open to moving past your comfort zone and embracing like a new challenge. Yeah. And, and by saying yes, you also adopt this natural growth mindset. You know, you're you're leading with your curiosity rather than, you know, uh, analytical yeah, uh, analytical mind. And then and I also think like saying yes invites like collaborations with other people. And mm -hmm. you know, there's a reason why improvisation is rooted in the phrase yes, uh, unlike no, which shuts down conversation yeah. and progress. Yes, often opens up positive possibilities and invites others to yeah. build uh, when together. When you wrote that in the notes, I thought that was really great. It was a really great association because it, yeah. it's so true. It's it's like, you know, improvisation. Yes, and you know, me and Graz just did a lot of that. You know, working on mm. the show together, and uh, you know, it, it's it's I never associated with you know day to day working and the types of things that I challenge myself with. I think it's it's a great it's a great analogy. Mm. And I think uh, yes also empowers others and like gives affirms others because you know if we're lucky to be looked up to whether it's our kids or whether it's our fans if we're, if we're lucky enough to have fans you mm -hmm. know um, choosing to say yes acts as like an affirmation to others that you see them and that you're paying attention to them and they yeah. matter and, it, and that signals trust to them which then empowers them to do something. You know that maybe they normally yeah. wouldn't have tried uh and i think one example of that is um laura kampf i'll never mm. something something in that i which she mentioned that she went to visit you once and then realized after spending some time with you that you could make videos then she could make videos right yeah and i then, didn't i you know honestly i don't think i i think i saw you say i could be wrong and laura would have to confirm this I don't think I met Laura until after she was making videos. So maybe she might have been inspired for me from afar. Uh, possibly, yeah. Yeah, you know, obviously, because uh, the ver the first video she made was inspired by me. It was the key, the key thing that, mm. and I remember I was like, I was, uh, you know, it almost brought me to tears. I was so, I was so honored, you know, because she was such a great maker and she gave me such a great send up by making something similar to what I made, but in her own take, you know, in the Laura comp way. I mean, Laura, Laura is amazing. She's such an incredible human being. Yeah. And, you know so um yeah and I, I i also think that saying yes just makes life more fun right because <laughs> i imagine if you said no to everything what what comes oh. of it and so uh, i think you... a little bit more yes to things always brings opportunities which also generally means fun well i'll tell you something and i'm gonna try and stop hitting my table so i'm gonna look a little awkward i'm gonna keep my hand beside my because i keep tapping my table when i get past i know it's gonna come <laughs> through in the microphone it's all right but uh <laughs> Um, we just did the show. We just did the show that was going to air on some streaming network eventually shortly this year. Um, probably in four or five months, everyone keeps asking me that question too, but it was, the show was amazing. And, and it was a huge collaboration with, you know, in some cases there was 15 people in the circle of conversation, what we're talking about. And there was certain phrases which drive me fucking nuts. And I basically said in an announcement, please don't ever say these fucking phrases again, because I don't give a fuck. <laughs> That's going to be expensive. Do you realize how much time that's going to take? Oh my God, but that's like so complicated. Like those three phrases, I say, can we please just fucking never say them? And if you feel the urge to say them, go outside and fucking say them out loud to a tree. Because <laughs> all it does is halt the collaboration. It just fucking slows things down. It's like, yeah, it's implied that every fucking thing is expensive. Everything is expensive. It's not my money. It's the fucking television company's money. And what they want, they want the most fucking incredible, fun, interesting thing that we could possibly get together while we're collaborating. And if you're sitting there going, that's expensive. Let's get the less expensive thing to save some juggernaut corporation $15. Right. How does that impact the end result? Let's not worry about 
all these stupid things, but what it is, and I've come to realize, it is everybody's personal fear. It's not his money. It's not her money. Right. They put themselves in. But they put themselves in. They're like, oh my God, if I had to pay for that uh, air actuator, that's, that's going to set me back. But you're not involved. You just happen to be a conduit right now in this process. Shut the fuck up and just stay involved with the fucking concept. I think it's a little different, right? Because, you know, uh, like your own projects, it is your money, (laughs) you know, like, right. So I'm my next project I'm building now is is a sushi train. But my wife <laughs> is that is that those knots you've been or those links you've been making? Yeah, but I look yeah. to be honest, it's, it's been on hold for a long time because yeah, I, yeah, it's yeah, been a while but, since I saw you working on it. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna get back into that eventually. Um, but the the goal is there to spend zero money, like the budget is zero. Right. Well, then that's part of the goal. Then that's fine. Right. I mean, you yeah. know, it has nothing to do with uh, you know that's you, you set a we all set a set of criteria. Like I'm making this trailer, and one of the criteria that I can't ignore is that it has to. I can't just go crazy and build a steel trailer. It has to have some light materials in it because there's a weight restriction. You know? Right, exactly. You set the criteria in the beginning of the project. I'm only going to make it out of what I could find in the wood pile. I'm only going to make it out of whatever gears and gizmos I find in the machine shop. Yep. And you know, if I do need a gizmo, you know, whatever, I'll, 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 I'll figure that out. Maybe I could fabricate it. You know, I, I got to this point now. Uh, and again, talking about the community, I'm really empowered by the community. It's like, Anytime I see some crazy old machine that I want to get, the first thing I think to myself is if it's missing anything, I'll just make it, you know? Whereas in the past, I'd be like, oh, fuck, if it's missing like the main gear, I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm. Now I'm like the fear and the empowerment of like being like, if I can't make it, I know Keith Rucker can make it. Right, have, exactly. You know, anybody, anybody can make it. And I'm friends with a lot of these guys or, or I could, you know, just pay them to make it for me. I could pay somebody I don't know to make it for me because now my information is, you know, my, my wealth of information has been so expanded with the community and, and the internet. Well, in so some way- I'm fearless when it comes to like, you know, trying to salvage a machine because there's, there's no excuse other than just me in, injecting my own personal fears, which aren't relevant. Well, I think, you know, coming back to the, the subject matter is, you know, like, because you've empowered others the second you put the ask out there for something you know people like yeah sure yeah no no, it's great you know like right now right now i don't know if you follow keith rucker it's on my mind because we've been chatting keith rucker is a vintage machine company vintage uh, machine salvage guy and um he came across these two one complete one dismantled to the point where maybe it's not salvageable giant bandsaws they're four feet throat so that means they're like 13 feet tall yeah and they were going to go into a scrap yard and he put it out there. He's like, who wants these? And I got messages from 10 people, including I saw it with my own eyes. I was like, I want those. Yeah. So I messaged and he said, there's a couple of people ahead of you. Everybody wants to look at them. And it's kind of like the, it's like the sword and the stone. Everybody tried and they're just like, it's up to you now. And so now I'm the first in line. So I said to Keith, you know, now that I got a little bit of money, like I'm not buying Ferraris and I'm not buying, you know, vacation homes. I'm like, uh, if that cost me five grand to get those two or seven or eight grand, they're mine, whatever it costs. Let's put some money at that because I'm saving these crazy, great machines, you know, it goes into my personal museum. I'll use them on YouTube. You know, when I see like a production company that was just here spends probably a quarter of a million dollars a week on, you know, the silly show we just made, I, I you know, I have the money so I can spend three or four or $5,000 it takes to get those machines in my possession and restore them. And uh, so I was like, why not? Why not? Let's just do it. Let's get them. Let's get them here. I'd hate to see them. You know, I hate to even know that they existed and that they went into a salvage yard, you know? Right. Yeah. I think that's, I, I'm glad someone like yourself has the money to to buy them and restore them because I, I just don't have the space all the time or well, that's yeah, it. all I mean, the, I'm all in the, the love affair, you know? <laughs> well, that's it. You know, we all, we all get turned on by different things. Exactly. You know, there are guys that collect watches and their whole entire collection is in their drawer, you know, and yeah. that's great. You know, yeah. I, I'm unfortunately, I collect giant heavy things. <laughs> my, my buddies, my, one of my buddies says, he's like, it's amazing. It's just like, it's everything you do. It's like, it's hundreds of pounds, everything you got to move, everything you do, it's just, everything is just heavy. Everything around you is heavy. Uh, I sorry. guess that's why you got a backhoe and, and all, <laughs> all those things. I need better equipment. In fact, I actually yeah, need more equipment. Exactly. Um, I want to get back on the subject. Um, 
where you say a, yes to a lot of things, not all, I imagine, but a lot of things. Where yeah. where did that philosophy sort of come from? Well, it, it it came from I guess living in New York City. If you really, if I really want to analyze it, living in New York City, uh, I was doing the toy business, and obviously living in New York is it costs money. And I had my workshop, and I had my I had my uh, apartment. I had a two bedroom apartment, which I lived in alone most of the time. And friends would always come and go because I had the extra bedroom. And I had uh, my workshop in the basement and I had a storefront. So I had three rentals in Manhattan. And just to keep them going, just to also just know that I had. And then I then I eventually bought this house in 2004. So when I think of that summer of 2004, when I bought the house, I'm in. So I had three rentals and a mortgage. And I realized, like, I broke it down. I thought to myself, wow, I'm like really overwhelming myself with, uh, you know, financial burden here. But I thought to myself, if I can get three jobs a month that are $2,000 each, that's $6,000. That would cover my nut at the time. And I enjoyed what I was doing. So it wasn't like I needed vacation money. It wasn't like I needed vacation time. Like in my mind, like that was the bare bones. If I could scrap together six plus thousand dollars a month in the city, which, and I looked around them like the city's got so much opportunity. I'm a guy that, that works with my hands. I could certainly do this. I was also designing and developing toys at the time, but I was slowly transitioning into doing interior design and just handyman stuff. Like I literally designed a toy for, you know, some big toy company. And then this bar would say, Hey, can you make me five tabletops? So I do that. And then I'd make the tabletops. <laughs> so I started saying yes to all this stuff because I needed the money literally needed the money but then to make it fun for myself i started to accept the challenge it wasn't like oh i gotta make these tabletops it'd be like okay how can i make tabletops that people want to enjoy how, what can i learn out of the process how can i join them and this was kind of just the, the beginning of like really referring to the internet for stuff so i'd call my friends that i know and I'd be like what's the best way to do this what like have you ever seen anybody do this what's you know there really you couldn't just whip up the internet and it wasn't really that way yet but it really got down to me just trying to figure out a way to earn that goal of, you know, paying for these things that I've acquired. And a, a, a friend of mine said to me a long time ago, she said, she was a big mentor in my life. We're still friends. She's still alive. She's older than me. I worked for her when I was 16. She was 30 at the time. And she saw the artist in me. And she always would give me these little pearls of wisdom. She'd be like, buy expensive things. It just forces you to work harder. She yeah. wasn't the type, like my dad would say, don't buy expensive things. How can you afford it? Like, that's my father's because he's putting his fear into everything. Right. But this friend of mine would be like, I, like I said, oh, I might buy this fancy car, you know, a used car. She's like, oh, that's great. That's awesome. And, and because it's, you know, because it's expensive, you're going to have to work harder, which is great because you'll just be more fruitful and more fruitful in the way of like, not like a factory job. I mean, I'm not the type of person that would be at a factory doing that job. I would make my own factory for my own products, my own thing. So they're in the ways that I'd be more fruitful. It's just a matter of if you put your back to the wall, how are you going to work out of it? So, so in many cases, I, I consciously dug holes for myself to, to dig myself out of in a way. Not, not bad. Not like I didn't take out, you know, a mortgage I couldn't afford and I didn't buy a, you know, a, a, a timeshare, <laughs> you know, but buying things like, and then I started thinking in terms of putting myself in the hole, I'd be like, if I spent the money to buy a new table saw or, you know, a new thing, like these are things that I could use to make more money. Right. And, and, and it gets my, and it satisfies the need in me to have something cool and new. You know, when you sit at, when you sit at Amazon at night and you're like, oh, I just bought a new bath set. I bought a new set of chairs, you know. I'm sitting at Amazon and I go, okay, which is the best camera I could buy? Like it, they, everything has a check mark in front of it. Is it something you could use to, to further your career or further your creative endeavors? You know? Yeah. Like I think I, a, a lot of people, do. Wheel the other night. you know, they bought a pottery wheel the other night. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people get in the trap of like buying things that they don't actually need. They buying things just kind of impress people. They don't even like you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like someone yeah. buy, someone will buy a fancy car to feel like they, you know, can impress someone that you know is a real jerk face. You know, like right, right. Why, you know, why do you need to impress that person? I, but I, I think do you do you think because you you saw like saying yes as more of a like a necessity to 
to get yourself out of these situations. Right. That, again, was, okay, that was early on, right? Was, that was yeah. Was that on. was there was there a like a point where you realized, oh wait a second, like if I say yes to things, opportunities come that I didn't really hundred percent. I mean, and then I started getting into the YouTube community. I mean, for instance, I would always say yes. A big inspiration for it, and I've said this in other podcasts, is when I was working in China. Uh, when I'm working in China, when I'm at a, a factory table, or you know, I'm, in, I'm deep in some village somewhere, and there's like a factory that makes dolls that we need to manufacture or stuff to animals or whatever. And when we sit with the factory people, and when you sit with, there's so much competition in China. Like literally, for pennies, you'll uproot everything and go to a different factory to save, like you know pennies at the end of the line, which is to me is ridiculous. I'm like, wait here now, let's just go with this. But in many cases, I wasn't the boss. I was just the engineer. So I was trying to satisfy everybody's needs. But when the boss would make the decision to be like, well, the, you know, the fact that the guy who's paying for all the product and who's in charge of sales would be like, nope, let's go to another factory. I don't like the way that, you know, they're trying to strong on me with this penny or that penny. And I'm like, all right, we got to do that. We got to do it. But the bigger point is, is anytime I sat with anybody, they would always say, no problem, no problem. You know, the word is momentai. It's a Chinese word for no, no, I don't know if it's Cantonese or whatever, but it's, mm -hmm. uh, it means no problem. Moment, that moment, that moment. You know, like you hear people talking and like, moment, that moment, that. it means like no problem. Yeah. So the idea of just nothing is an issue because you don't want to be that guy that goes, oh, that's going to be expensive. <laughs> and well, you, you, know, you, you know lost, what? You lost business as soon as you. Yeah. Right? So you got to constantly be like, everything's great. I can handle it. I can figure this out. I like the challenge. I'm up for the challenge. And that's how the culture there in China is. It's just like, because they want the business because they know the business translates to money, business translates to survival and then relationships that develop translates to, you know, prosperity. You, really, right. You could be the company that has the next super soaker. You could have the next Rubik's cube. You could have, you know, the next, uh, I can't even think of a good example anymore, but you know, beanie baby or whatever it is mm. so every product is great and everything can be done you know that's the culture there when you're dealing with the factory people and that really rubbed off on me so when it, when i was kind of getting myself into those like kind of financial uh you know i'd like to say squeeze because it wasn't a crunch i wasn't panicked i never panicked <clears throat> but when i get myself into those little financial squeezes i'll be like okay i'll figure this out just got to come up with more work figure out more work and then when i speak to um when I speak to, say, for instance, I used to do this work for this. It was a, a Russian restaurant group. Like the parent company was in Russia, but they own like 20 restaurants in New York. And I'd speak to the Tatiana was the girl in charge. She'd be like, uh, we need 10 tables for this new restaurant. We're going to open up uh, in 10 days. We need 10 tabletops. Can you handle it? I would just say, yeah, absolutely. What do you need? How many more? Instead, and, but in my mind, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do 10 table touch. But yeah. outwardly, I'd be like, yeah, sure. What do you know? How can we do this? What do you want? Like, what color do you want? What type of wood? I'll take care of it. And it be I became like the hit man. You know, she would call me all the time. She'd be like, oh, this big thing, this guy broke, built, broke off the wall. Can you get over here and fix it? I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. I'll get over there and fix it. And, you know, I built a table for her. This is a silly story. I built this big, giant, like dining table for her. It was like 12 foot long table three feet wide, you know, kind of farmhouse table, all big oak planks for the, uh, sorry, maple planks for the top. And um, she's like, I want it to be longer. So I made these big extensions that poke into the end of the apron yeah. and just make the table two feet longer. So now the table was like 15. Now it's like 19 feet long. And <clears throat> after New Year's Eve one day, she's like, the table broke. I'm like, how can the table broke? She's like, no, nah, it broke table broke i'm like there's no way the table broke. i said okay cool let me go look at it just sucked it up you know she's like your table broke and she was kind of annoyed with me i'm like okay let me go see it looked like a bomb went off on the end like the apron was destroyed and broken and i'm thinking to myself there's only one way that this could break is if this cantilever table was like pushed down really hard now i don't know how that could have happened and the one of the employees goes oh yeah tatiana was dancing on the table with like 20 people on new year's eve <laughs> She left that part out of the story they and I fixed there. the table and I fixed the table. I kept my mouth shut because I wasn't going to argue with her because that meant, you know, she might alienate me. I don't want to do that. So I fixed the table. And then when I delivered it, I said, don't dance on it again. And she just like turned bright red and said, I won't, you know, so and like I, I took that opportunity to kind of make like a little cutesy relationship thing with her instead of being like a complainy bitch and be like, well, you, you I'm not fixing the table. You broke it. You know, I could have done that. 
you know but, but then do you, yeah like then came more business i'm sure after that right? yeah because she re- like then we had this little bonding moment of like all right i lied he caught me in a lie whatever it wasn't mm-hmm. a big lie i would have fixed the table anyway yeah and she did pay me to fix it right yeah, exactly know. I mean, I didn't even care at that point because I knew it just meant, you know, if I just go with the flow, I'll just get more business anyway. And I always did. I, you know, I actually, the reason I stopped doing business with us because we started doing this Discovery TV show. Yeah. Has there, has there been like, what is there like a one of the greatest opportunities that came from saying yes, that you kind of like just sort of came out of the, out of the blue? Um, You know, I can't think of any one giant opportunity, but you know, there are moments in time where, like, you're confronted with, well, what, only because he just texted me. I'll tell you a funny story about my friend Andrew Alexander. He's like a very A personality. He's Blacksmith Tools on YouTube, on Instagram, yep. rather. Yep. And he's such an A personality. And there are moments in time where I'm like confronted with a, hey, can we talk? And I don't want to talk. Like, whoever it is, it could be, you know, I, I, it could be a client or it could be just a, a new friend. And I have this fear of like, getting to know somebody but it's just my own gut reaction to be like no i don't i really don't want to talk and he and i were texting on instagram like you know two girls like just becoming friends on instagram this is like four or five years ago Hmm. and he said and he just texted he's like let's talk tonight and i was just like oh man i don't really want to talk i was like great no problem (laughs) (laughs) and when we spoke on the phone we 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 talked for like two and a half hours like we would like two little kids that like you know teenage lover yeah teenage lovers your toy where do you keep your tools oh my shop's a mess my shop's a mess too oh my god it doesn't matter as long as you like we had all these like philosophies that connected so when andrew and i very first spoke on the phone we talked on the phone for about two hours and we hit it off but that fear initially and i mean that's just an example i'm thinking of happening to me right now because like i said he's just reaching out to me for something that that fear initially was uh, but because of my relationship with him i got into blacksmithing i developed this whole love for blacksmithing tools which was a fear of mine like i knew i was always afraid to get into blacksmithing because i figured like it's a real exclusive club and i don't know what i'm doing yet i'd have to know what i'm doing before i invite my club but getting to know him and many other blacksmiths it's just like everybody's welcomed in the club as long as you're willing to show some there is no there is no initiate it's just it was my own fear 100 percent. i thought people were going to judge me but getting to know and, and andrew doesn't even blacksmith he just knows everything about tools he blacksmiths a little bit but like he doesn't even want a blacksmith he just wants the tools which is great <laughs> you know it's like a funny thing he just knows every he's like an authority on anvils and blacksmithing tools and my relationship with eric developed because of my relationship with him it's funny he said do you want to come to this blacksmithing event in montana and again that's another moment like my first step was like no i don't want to go but then (laughs) but outwardly i'm like absolutely let's do it because i know it's an opportunity and when i did that i met will stelter uh who's a very uh popular famous knife maker um i and i met more importantly andrew uh eric from hand tool rescue like I, I got there and, and Eric, uh, sorry, I got there and Andrew's like, oh yeah, Eric from Hansel Rescue's coming. I go, the guy that restored, like Eric and I had talked a little bit, but I didn't even know he was going to be in Montana. I didn't mm-hmm. even know he was going to be at that event. Like I, I explicitly didn't know. I mean, maybe he told me and I didn't pay attention, but we developed our friendship. The three of us developed our friendship there. And then when we left that event, that was like almost three years ago, four years ago, we just kept the text chain going, which was hilarious. The three of us were just always goofing on each other, but the, the entire time sharing information, the entire time, oh my God, look at this. Oh my God, you can get this. Oh my God, look at how cool this is. Look at this crazy thing. Do you ever see one of these? And I said to them one day, I'm like, guys, this has to be a podcast. Right. Exactly. The three of us know nothing about technology in like a big way, but this has to be a podcast. Let's figure this out. And so, you know, it took us two and a half years to do 34 episodes because we're both the three of us are all so disjointed you know like no schedule no pressure we do it when we do it and it turned out to be a really good fun collaboration which might lead to something else right now you know the three of us uh might potentially lead to it might lead to a show we don't know we've been trying to pitch this concept of a tv show and we have a little bit of interest but the important thing is when andrew said let's talk tonight that initial fear of you know, not wanting to meet somebody on the phone. And so it's nice talking to somebody through the internet because you don't really have to really talk to them. 
you know? <laughs> <laughs> but when you actually talk to them, all these fears and anxieties like come up and it's just me. Maybe it's not everybody, but I think everybody has a little bit of that fear and anxiety. You know, there was a little bit of a, uh, you know, a slight bit of like anticipation talking to you. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's the point. Like I sent you a DM and said, you know, Hey, would yeah. you, can, do you want to be on the show? And you wrote back, sure. Anytime. And I'm thinking in here, he's probably <laughs> going, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, leading up, leading up to like when I said, I, yes, I definitely meant that. But this morning when you and I hadn't emailed, like, you know, as soon as I woke up, I was like, yeah. all right, maybe. All right, cool. I got the day off. Maybe something happened. Maybe it's not going to email. And then you email minutes before we start, which I thought was very cool because I always try, like I set a time and I trust it. Like I set a, a set a date and I trust it. You know, some people set a date and they're like, are you sure Thursday's good? Uh, is Thursday going to be okay? You know, you get 10 messages. I'm like, yeah, Thursday's good. I said it was good. I mean it. I mean what I say. Yeah. And you know, I'm, then you mean what you say. You said Thursday at eight 30 and like eight 15, you're like, okay, here's the zoom link. And we hadn't talked at all between now and then. And I was like, oh, that's cool. But the thing is I, I trust you, but I've, I mean, yeah, I've, I've had guests where I like literally am ready to record. I'm standing there waiting and, you know, send a message and like, Hey, we're Nothing. on, are you coming? And then I, then of course I close everything down and like four hours later, I was like, Oh, was that today? Sorry, man. <laughs> you know, I, you know, and yeah. you're like, Oh, I've done and, and I I've mean, done some, guilty. some, some people that like were begging to get on the show, you know, and then they just right. blew me off and I was like, Oh, you know, so of course <laughs> I, I, I don't hold it against them, but you know, it's just, yeah, it's usually just a scheduling thing because we're all so yeah, scared. Yeah. And things. of course I just, I of course say when they say, Oh, can we reschedule? Of course I say yes. Yeah. So, um, and we do. And we, so, um, you know, that's part of it. Um, so I, it's funny. So I always think just to, to, to wrap up that thought, yeah. I always think of those moments the very first time I got a message from, say, for instance, when Andrew and I started talking and then he's like, let's talk on the phone. That led to a, a complete relationship, which has just been fruitful since the moment we started talking. I mean, not only is he a good friend and I can trust him, but, you know, for business, we've had this, you know, ongoing opportunity for me to get into blacksmithing and blacksmithing tools and for me to share my contacts with him that could potentially be fruitful for him or the friends that I connect him to. So, it's it's been great and not to mention you know the amount of wealth that i brought to my fans and people that know him because of me that otherwise right. would never you know because we all have our circles and the venn diagram of where we overlap is is fairly large but sometimes you meet somebody and you're like oh you never met so-and-so he's got two million subscribers I'm like i never even heard of this guy oh my god right, exactly. i don't know who this was how did you and, not know about garage avenger i i just don't know exactly how do, you, <laughs> like, how do you not know about that guy he's so handsome <laughs> absolutely <laughs> that's what i'm saying about you yeah that's actually what i was gonna mention that that's yeah. the that's the only thing i got from your shout out on making <laughs> was that i'm tall and handsome well what's funny is that, uh when i first saw you in england when we were all there i'm like who is this guy i thought you were like a local news reporter or something i was like, I was like no no he's just a maker but i felt like i knew you like i felt like i had maybe seen you or and i maybe i had but you know when i saw you the other thing too is in this community there's such a comfortability with everybody like we're all like in the same thing so when you meet somebody you're all like i, I say this in the past you're all you, you meet somebody like i'm when i met you we're all like on our fifth date you know what i'm saying it's well, not like that awkwardness of like ah, what are you interesting doing? thing i will just share this with you so i have heard i had heard of you and i never but i'd never really sat down and watched a lot of content i watched like maybe a couple of videos so right. I knew who you were, but like, and people like I was with a couple of guys, you know, and they're like, oh, it's Jimmy Duresta, you know, like they were, <laughs> yeah, you know, point over, and you, you had like this posse around you, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, a lot of these guys that I was hanging around, they're like, oh, we couldn't, you know, like approach and like, yeah, Europeans are very, but, Europeans, it's so funny. Europeans are like very, I, I guess it's their respectful of space. I don't know exactly how to put it, but. Americans will be like, yo, what's up, man? How you doing? Like, give me a fist bump and walk on. Europeans, I'll see them like a little kid in this corner being like all like getting ready to come over and bother me. And then when they come and bother me, like, do you, you know, they're like very respectful. Yeah, yeah. But like Americans are like, yo, what's up, asshole? I, I heard that thing you said. That was funny. And then I'll just move on. <laughs> I think I, I, I remember because you guys had this like posse group sort of at the hotel. And I remember just going, 
in my head, I just said, fuck it. I was going to go in and introduce myself. So I just, <laughs> just barged in there. People were like looking at me like, who's this fucking tall dude just coming in here? Like <laughs> saying who's like, and they're like, Garage Avenger, who's that guy? You know, like, but that's you know. why I think like when I met you, I was like, oh, you know, like, I got to know this guy. Like I got to, I got to know more about this guy. And then I realized like, I thought, you know, you were like a, like a host of a show or something, but you're the host of obviously your own show. But at the time, you just seem like because you're big, you're big, and you're, you're bigger personality than than average. So it stood yeah, I, out. I think, uh, but I also bring back to the to the topic here. You know, like in my own head, you know, there was never a no in like going to meet you or going. Hundred percent. That's another that really like, important. Yeah. Another sorry to cut you off. Another really important thing is like a friend of mine once said to me. And I don't mean to say that I'm your hero when I say this, but a friend of mine said to me, get to know your heroes. And I do that all the time. It's another reason why I say yes, even though I might have social anxiety. Like it's, like when when Nick uh, uh, asked me to come to make make a central, like the first thing I says, I don't want to go to England. Like I don't want to leave this. Like I don't want to leave my house ever, really, quite quite honestly. But I said, okay, great. It'd be an opportunity to meet European makers. You know, YouTubers. It's funny. I, I when I met Colin Farris, I was like, I was like a little kid, and, and but I I didn't for one minute assume he knew who I was because mm. his channel's like a juggernaut, and I'm you know I'm smaller than him. So I hang out. I'm like, oh my god, this is incredible. He's like, it's like the time you did that. And I'm like, you you know who I am? He's like, of course right. I know who you are. I'm like, you know who I am? You watch my <laughs> stuff. So you know, it's. It, even if I didn't say yes, me Duresta feels like a small kid sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, even if I didn't say yes to going over to, to make a central, I wouldn't have the opportunity to meet him. And Yuri, Yuri uh, Touchman is like another. I love Yuri. He's such an incredible maker. You know, I yeah. got to meet Yuri for the first time, and, and again, he and I just connected like we're all buddies, like immediately. Yeah, because I I will never forget because it, one because it was embarrassing, in some ways, but it wasn't like. I sat down with um, uh, Bob Claggett and a couple other big guys, including um, uh, um, Derek from Madden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we're, were sitting there, and I I saw Bob across the table, and I said, "So, uh, are you a maker? <laughs> Do you make stuff?" <laughs> I had no clue who he was. <laughs> oh, really? That's funny. <laughs> and, he, and and Bob was like kind he's like yeah yeah i dabble <laughs> yeah so, you know so you know i think that's also humility coming into it. it's like i didn't know who he was and he knew that so yeah i um, never i never for any i never flex because obviously it's it's inappropriate it's you know it's 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 stupid you come across looking like an asshole but the other day but it does help in certain circumstances yeah, you I'll talked about this the other day on, on the on the Make It podcast, isn't it? Like, I did. I forget what I'm about yeah. to say. I forget that I, what I said then, but I'll tell you what I said. There are moments in time, like for instance, uh, like I'm going to get these, I'm trying to get these big bands, so so I'm making phone calls. Who knows who lives in the area? Who can help me secure them and and lift them out of the building before they raise the building, break the building down? Yeah. And um, uh, so I was on the phone with somebody, and the guy was very like, "Yeah, no problem. We get them. Yeah, no problem. We get them. We get them." I, I'm like, "Wow!" I'm like, "There's no resistance. It's not like I don't know if my machine can handle it. I don't know if I got the time. You know, yeah, no problem. Great." I'm like, "Cool, man." Um, I go, "Uh, I don't know if I, I don't know if you you know what I do." I said, "I, I collect these machines. Goes, I know everything about you." I was like, "Oh, cool." He's like, "I'm a huge fan." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, great." <laughs> so the first part of the conversation was very upbeat and positive, and I'm like, "Oh right. my god, I wish everybody was this amenable to like a challenge." You know, he's going to pick up two two thousand pound saws, and he's like, "No problem, we'll figure it out." Turns out he didn't really have the, his equipment wasn't up to, to par, but that initial conversation, and when I realized he he knows me and he has the same passion I do, and he actually knows exactly what I do, I was like, oh, "All right, this should go smooth," because sometimes you talk to somebody and it, this is just american work uh in uh, american work ethic in general it's like everybody's like this close to quitting the, the gig everybody's like a hair thin away from being like man fuck it i don't feel like doing this yeah even if you pay them get involved so that is my fear anytime i initiate somebody to help me do something but when i find out they're a fan of mine they're also now they're part of the challenge with me they're part of the the passion and that's that's a 
that's to my advantage, obviously. But then it's like a communal effort. It's like they're going to get mentioned in line if they want. You know, I'm going to be like, maybe it becomes a vlog segment or whatever. But when you talk to somebody that doesn't have any attachment to the community, doesn't know or care who I am, which they don't have to, it's not an obligation. It just goes back to that American work ethic where at any given moment, they're going to bail on you and you're never going to hear from them again. Yeah, well, I think it comes back down to what we talked about before, empowering people. Like, because he's a fan, he knows and respects what you do and mm -hmm. he's willing to go the extra mile. Right. You know, he's empowered to be part of it, to be part of it right? Mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. Is there something that you say no to? Like, where do you draw the line and say no to something? Well, I, I've always said this. When you meet somebody that you're going to do something for, there's always that moment where you're like, how much of an asshole is this person? Yeah. Then you're like, okay, they're, they're not an asshole at all. That's, that's, that's great. Awesome. I mean, I could learn something from this person. And then you realize this person is a taker. All they do is take, 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 take. They give nothing back. Mm. And they're not even kind about it. And that's really one of the biggest uh, factors of me saying yes or no to anything is like the person that I have to deliver for. If it's a corporation, I'll say yes, because it's like, you know, it's like working for an insect. It doesn't matter. But <clears throat> when it's for somebody personally, um, it's really important that we have a chemistry or at least we like each other. Um, the, I tell the story all the time where this one woman didn't know me and she didn't, there's no reason she should know me. This was way before I was any type of public figure. And uh, she was just nervous. She was like insecure and nervous about this work I was going to do for her. And she kept saying, well, is it going to look good? I'm like, well, I'm sure it's going to look good because I trust my ability. She's like, yeah, well, I don't know you. And she kept going on and on. She had already given me a down payment. It was only like five or $400. I was like, you know what? I mean, this conversation was going on for like five minutes where I could just tell that her fears and anxieties were like, she was basically having a panic attack with me on the phone. Yep. And I, you know, in hindsight, I didn't realize it at the time. And I said, you know what? Um, I'm going to mail you back your check and you could just find somebody else to do it. She's like, why? I was like, I haven't even begun the work and you're so afraid it's not going to look good. Yeah. I can only imagine what it's going to look, you know, I know it's going to look good, but I don't know what your definition of look good is versus mine. I said, it'll look as good as it can possibly look for the budget. I mean, I wasn't going to do anything shoddy in any way. And I had already done work in the office where she was. That's how I got the gig was because the other women in her shared office, I had done all their stuff. I said, you could see what I did for the other women. You could take a look. They go, you hired me based on that. I said, it's going to look as good as that, if not better. And then when she was just this anxiety panic attack she was having, I just I go, here's your money back. I'm going to mess you. I just mailed her a check. So you say no measured on realistically the person if they're like a, a giving person or an yeah. a warm and welcoming person, then you've got no problem with doing yeah. stuff for them. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a, that's a really cool moral compass just to, I mean, because let's be honest, you know, someone that's just takes and takes, there may be a source of income for a while until they start taking from someone else and drop you. Right. So whereas yeah. the people that are really, you know, loving your stuff, positive about, you know, bringing you on to a project, right? Uh, you know, they're going to keep on paying you for the next right. project because they right. just love you for who you are and what you do, right? And like, I think it comes down to like that whole sense of empowerment too, right? People often employ you to do something because they've seen what you've done for other people you know, or they've mm -hmm. been watching you for years or mm -hmm. you know they enjoy your personality or whatever it is so yeah i think that that works really well for business model as well yeah it's really important too when you're trying to decide whether you're going to do something for anybody um if you can't have if you can get any history on them even and i i've said this example in the past if you're going to have lunch with somebody and you're sitting down with them and they can't decide what they want to eat for lunch as a potential client. And you just go, yeah, give me the hamburger. Great. Thanks. Have a nice day. You don't even open the menu. And then they're looking at the menu like, can you, can you give me the chopped salad? And can you, can you put the chopped salad with tuna fish? Oh, it's not on the menu, but can you do it for me? And then you realize what a pain in the ass that person. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Because just the simple task of ordering lunch is complicated. They're afraid they're making the wrong decision the entire time. I, like how are you going to satisfy the colors of the choices that you make right. for the same person? And you, so you, you know, you, I've been with people and I hear, I hear them talk to other people on the phone, like, well, like while we're together, they get a phone call 
and I hear them talking to somebody, whether it's somebody that works for them or just anybody, they'd be like, can I take this call? Give me a minute. And then like they walk away and I hear, and I see them, and you could see their physical gestures. They might be arguing with somebody or they might just simply be curt and rude to somebody. And you go, you know, I go, all right, I'll give you a quote. And those are the people that get the quote. That's like the, the bag off quote. And like, wow, this is really expensive. I'm like, yeah, it's the best I could do right now. And the worst is when they go, okay, let's do it. And you're like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's one of the one of the the problems with saying yes to a lot of stuff is you know when you give that ridiculous price and they do say yes you're like oh man now I'm committed to <laughs> work now you work through it and then then you basically say okay and then then I say to myself this is going to be a college this is a college education course right now that I'm I've enlisted it's a course in psychology it's a course in satisfying someone's needs it's a course in being able to follow somebody else's direction if they're going to be a pain in the ass. You know, you know, it's, I've done so many jobs. It's hard to, for me to really nail down, you know, any particular good examples, but it's really just an overall feeling of knowing like the minute you speak to somebody, you go through all these, you know, it's kind of like, it, it's, you're like the Terminator where you have like these, this heads up display, just going through all the similar scenarios. And, you know, these people like they're talking and they're saying, or, or whether it's a client or a corporation in an email and they're hitting all these different, and you know, you know, they, they fall into the favorable category or they fall into the non so favorable category and you make a decision based on that. Let's talk about favorable categories. Mm -hmm. uh, both you and Taylor are pretty busy people. You know, you've mm -hmm. got a lot of things going on. How do you prioritize saying yes to spending time with each other, you know, when you've got all these other commitments you've said yes to? Well, a lot of times, like, for instance, I'm doing this enclosed trailer and I was like, this is going to be a big job. I'm going to be working late at night. And she'd be like, no, it's going to be awesome because it's going to be awesome. We're going to figure out how to make our own enclosed trailer. You know, so she's she's really up for challenges like that. She mm. likes that. Obviously, it's a work balance. And and uh, we jokingly said it before the podcast started. It's like, I look over at her and if she's working, she's she's getting, I'm like, okay, I could work. When she's like, I'm done. I don't want to do anything anymore. I'm like, uh, okay, it is nine o'clock at night. Let's uh, let's have some family time. <laughs> you know, it's right, like, yeah. But last night we worked in the shop in the black barn in the backyard till 1.30 in the morning. Hmm. She's like, you're going to come outside with me while I work on my chair? I was like, sure just to keep her company and you know we're just in you know it's like when you've been with somebody for 11 years you just like just be near each other is almost enough you know yeah well i mean i think it's it comes down to quality time like you both like being out there and building stuff and doing stuff you don't have to be on top of each other right yeah but yeah. like that is quality time for you guys right so you're looking after 100%. each other in that regard it's like just you being there around for her is you know support enough for her yeah. you know to say hey he cares like he's around yeah. you know like he's not always doing other people's work and and running mm -hmm. off finding giant band saws and you know yeah sort of <laughs> well while she was working on that i was working on the enclosed trailer which is in the same shop so I'll, yeah but i didn't i was done for the day like i was done and she's like come outside and i want to go work on this thing and so i'm like all right so we went outside and i was like well she's doing that and i'm just like omnipresent i'll keep working on this trailer so i did a whole nother three hour round of working on the trailer which was you know, any little bit moving it along helps, you know, any little incrementally forward movement is, is important. We, we talked a little, oh, I've talked a lot about, you know, having sort of empowering people. You, your videos have a big influence on the maker community. Your style is replicated through many people's uh, videos. And, you know, many people have told stories of you them just dropping by your workshop and you'd be like hey nice to see you like here have a you know dud ice pick that we were going to throw out anyway or whatever <laughs> right yeah, or you know whatever it is but th those people are, like stoked you know yeah um do you have any examples of someone you've met where they were perhaps nervous uh, or just scared to do things and you feel like you've had a real part to empower them through what you do. Well, you know, I could always tell, and and I'm such a mush. I get emotional real easily with people. I've, I've actually cried with several fans, you know, because they've shared some moment in time with me that, you know, where, where I helped change, you know, a direction or whatever. They've been, I can always tell when someone comes up to me and they're nervous, you know, obviously they have anxiety that's outside of me. And when they're nervous or if I could see the shaking and, and I immediately try and like kind of like 
It's just, you know, so like, what do you make? Tell me about what you make. You know, that disarms them immediately, takes the onus off of me. And then they start, oh, well, I make cutting boards. And like, oh, well, show me about your cutting boards. Like, what what do you, what type of wood do you use? What type right. of machines? Do you and it immediately like gets them out of that like anxiety of like, oh my God, I'm meeting somebody that's, you know, done so much for me. And then, then we can talk on a, you know, on a, on a, on an easier level. I just try my best to disarm people and make them feel comfortable I'm, because it makes me feel comfortable, you know, to try and work through someone's anxiety and just ignore it is, you know, is, is not doing anybody any, any good might make them more nervous, but there have been many times where, you know, for instance, Derek, Derek would sit right here and attest to that. Actually, Derek and I, we shot a pilot. This is a funny story. I don't know if this clip will ever make it to the air. We shot a pilot for a TV show where the, the interviewer asked, you know, what has Jimmy done for you? Something to that aspect. And Derek just went on to, and I just sat there, started crying. And the two of us started crying. <laughs> <laughs> and the producer's like, you guys are making my job so easy. And, uh, <laughs> It was basically just Derek saying how he was inspired by YouTube. And then when he found me, he was inspired by me. And, you know, obviously, you know, I, I, Derek and I just did the show together and, and he's, he's never, he never fails to thank me. Not that I need it, but he's just, he's just really cognizant and, and thankful that our friendship has brought him to where he is now. And, you know, the friendships with many of us, not, necessarily, not just necessarily me, you know, all the people like I introduced him and Graz, they were like at a bar together. I'm like, hey, you guys live in the same town, I think you guys should say hi. And yeah. then they become close friends. I know Graz said that, told that story on your podcast. And, <clears throat> but just, uh, <clears throat> you know, stuff like that is, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, it makes me want to cry right now, just crying joy, you know, out of joy, you know. Yeah, I mean, I th I feel that's kind of like the goal of of sharing your work. That's the yeah. goal of my my work. Like, I want to see people make their ideas reality. Like, there's so yeah. many people saying no. I, I could never. I could never do this. You know. Yeah. And I kind of want to show people like, if that retard can make that, uh -huh. then I can give something a crack. You know, I can give. Yeah. A go, you know? Right. Yeah, it's funny, um, you know, talk about the open door policy. I think of all the opportunities that I would miss and all the friendships that I would miss if I didn't make that phone call, if I didn't leave my door open on the sidewalk, if I didn't have, you know, a very loose policy of people who can come and visit me. You know, some of my closest friends are people that I've met just because we shook hands at an event or because they walked in my door. You know, Graz walked right in my door. You know, Graz is one of my closest bros now. And he like literally walked down the sidewalk. He's, yeah. I remember yeah. listening to him saying, and he said that we, he emailed the setup, but I don't even remember that part. I just remember him walking in and going, hey, what's up? I'm like, oh, hey, what's up? You make stuff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, you know, like I see, like, for instance, like Casey Neistat, I mean, he had a different scenario because he was completely mobbed with hundreds of little kids. But, you know, Casey has a thing on his door, absolutely no visitors. And he had a different situation. It was more intimate. <clears throat> it was more like up inside of a building. But Casey always had like no visitors anytime you know, without an appointment. And uh, he, he has no lack of opportunity, but I'm thinking to myself, <clears throat> I couldn't live my life like that. It would be, yeah, people respect my house. Like some, a lot of people know where I live, but people don't come here. Once in a long while, somebody might pop through and say, hey, I saw you're outside. I want to say hi. Oh, thank you so much. And they wander on. But, you know, at my shop, I feel it's kind of like it's a communal space. You know, this, this, this May community is such a communal society and you know for me to be like oh my door is shut no one's allowed in here without an appointment you know to me setting up an appointment is a pain in the ass i'd rather you just walk in and ambush me hang out for a minute and then you know take off and now we're friends right it's, yeah it's it's it's, um, it's almost more fun more do you fun think do you think you if you'd said no to a lot of things like the big opportunities or you know anything like that do you think you would have the same freedom and fun in your life as you do now? Um, I, I certainly wouldn't be <clears throat> as experienced and, uh, you know, seasoned as a problem solver. I've, a perfect example is, uh, you know, it's funny. Sometimes people see more in me than I see in myself. And I, and I always said that growing up, I just always thought I was an artist because that came natural to me. But my, my art teachers were always like, here, do this. You're an artist. You can do it. And I'm like, what? I'm just doing what I do. You know? hmm. <clears throat> and a good example is I worked for these architects and the architects had a client that wanted everything in Corian, everything in the apartment in white Corian, Arctic white. 
And I was like, I didn't ever work with Corian. And the architect's like, it's the same thing as wood. It's just got to glue it together. He goes, just, you could do it. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And it's expensive. He goes, we'll just charge more. I'm like, he goes, I want you to do it. He goes, I want your artful playfulness. I'm like, uh, okay. And together me and this architect designed all this stuff and I built it all. And I had never worked with Corian. And if anybody else hadn't encouraged me, I wouldn't have done it. Right. So. You know, I would have immediately said no, because it's not my skill set. But he said, you could do it. Don't worry. It's just like wood. It's just doesn't have a grain structure. And you just got to glue it with the same color. It's like, oh, OK. He's like, I'll help you. And he didn't help me at all. But, <laughs> 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 you know, he was just trying to talk me into doing it. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think now how Corian now is like is, is in my repertoire of things I I don't really promote working with Corey and I like it more as like a CNC right, surface yeah. and experimental surface. But, <clears throat> you know, the amount of work I did on that job, I basically took a full on college course on how to work with Corey. And, and I wouldn't have done that if I, if I didn't say yes, I needed a little nudging in that regard, but you know, there's so many things I'm glad I said yes to because I'm that much smarter. Whereas most people would just immediately say, Nope, not my thing. Yeah. Not my thing. Right. Mm. Uh, no, I'll tell you a funny thing. On that same job, I'm thinking of the fears and anxieties that come up <clears throat> on that same job. They had all these cabinets with painted glass. The back of the glass is painted. And I said to the architect, I'm like, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know. How do you paint the back? Oh, you just use oil paint. I'm like, okay. So I did this whole cabinet with glass. All the glass is custom cut and beveled by somebody else. I brought it. I painted it, glued it to the cabinets. Client calls me, hey, the glue lines are shown through the paint. I'm like, really? I come, all the glue lines are like pulled off. The paint is pulled off the glass. Oh, no, yeah. And I, and the client was amazing. Could have screamed and yelled and said, you know, what the F, what's going on? He's like, I guess, I guess the paint didn't hold. Obviously the paint didn't hold. So I went back and did some research and finds out there's a glass etching paint that you need to use, which is like a two-part epoxy with this highly toxic stuff. It's not just regular oil paint. No. But now I'm that much smarter. Now I know if you ever have to paint the back. So I had to redo everything, which was not a big deal. The client was patient enough. The cabinet was still there. I just took all the glass off it. I had all the glass met on with clips. So we were able to remove all the glass, paint it, bring it all back and install it right in the place. But, you know, I think of moments in time like that where uh, if I didn't say yes to that job, have it screw up, fix it. Uh, this whole, and I would think, oh, you just paint the back of glass with regular oil paint. Now I know to paint the back of glass, if it's going to be a piece of furniture, it has to be done with this metal chromoly epoxy yellow paint, or it was yellow, but any, you know, you got to pick the right color paint, but it, it's a special paint costs like $150 a gallon comes with a catalyzer and it smells to hell. It'll kill you when you <laughs> yeah. do it outside. Yeah. It smells like the only other time I smelt that smell was when I was driving when they were repainting the Williamsburg bridge and they had like these big giant tarps and there was painting this toxic paint and that's the exact same smell, some type of like chrome, chrome chemical or something it's called. Yeah. You're, I feel like you have these positivity and sort of humbleness traits to your, to your life. How much of your success or so-called success, you know, could you attribute to, that opposed to your raw talent of making things, do you think? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, I'm inspired by a guy named Barry Katz, who was a, a manager who got me a TV show early on, and he was my brother's comedy manager. And he's he's got a great podcast called Industry Standard. And Barry says it all the time. He says, there's two things you want to be. You want to be undeniable. And I've said that before, and I attribute it to Barry. You want to be undeniable. You want to be an undeniable talent, whatever it is. You want, you don't want to give anybody the opportunity to go, yeah, but you know, you want to like, like, like Bo Burnham, like for instance, like Bo Burnham, the comedian actor, I just watched this special and it's just like, this guy is unbelievably talented. Like Bobby Duke, he's like unbelievably talented, you know, and he's fun. And so the two part is you want to be undeniable and you want to be a good hang. You want to be a good hang. Like you hear like all these success stories of these comedians that got this close to being successful because they were so funny, but they were like a huge pain in the ass cokehead. Right. Yeah. So they weren't a good hang. So they just fell, they fell, you know, to the side and, you know, in the history of uh, entertainment, you know, you think of all these talented people, but they're not a good hang and you want to be a good hang. You know, even like there were moments on the show where I lost my temper 
because people weren't cleaning up enough or they weren't putting my tools away. And I might explode and be an asshole, but I'm funny while I'm doing it. And then as soon as I'm done, I apologize to everybody personally. You know, you don't want to be that guy that like throws a wrench and just expects everybody to be okay with it. And mm. you don't have any self, uh, you know, self-awareness that that wasn't right. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a good thing, you know? And uh, so there were times where I kind of blew up a little bit, but I always apologize to everybody. And I said, I'm sorry. I just, you know, it, and while I'm getting mad, I'm trying to be funny. You know, I'm, I'm, it's kind of my New York personality is to like be an asshole, but also look for the laugh while I'm doing it. Yeah, because they, they say, I'm you not know, saying that I'm not saying that gets me off the hook. I'm just saying not, no, it's more but, fun to watch somebody be funny and mad and then mad and mad. Well, they say, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And, and so like, if you're a bad person to hang with, you know, you're not going to make any friends. Are you? So and therefore yeah. you, you're not broadening your network. And getting yeah. to know more people and then the opportunities dry up right so yeah uh, I, I think that's that's a good take on it yeah so i always say when someone's like we had a good time last night i'm like yeah it was a good hang and that always reminds me of what barry said you know barry says it all the time on his podcast you want to be a good hang you know you like you don't want to be a bummer you like you don't want to be a guy like and again his thing is really uh, television centric and entertainment centric you don't want to be the guy in the crew that's just like always annoyed or never has money or is always complaining oh we don't want to go to that restaurant there's no girls there i'm like let's just go you have no idea who's going to walk through the door let's just right. go and eat. oh there's the girls that were usually ugly the waitresses are mean i'm like let's just go you know like there's always that one guy in your crowd that's always like ah, i don't want to go there I, I ate there yesterday i'm like i don't care eight other people didn't let's go there <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know let's uh let's get into the rapid fire five are you ready for this yeah let's do it. all right cool fill in the blank creativity is freedom what's something that people get wrong about you that i'm an asshole <laughs> who thinks that i don't think anyone thinks that <laughs> no well from afar it's funny like i see i see my views are up because people voyeuristically want to see what i'm doing but mm. my subscriber count is way low so yeah. like if you do like you know we all compare each other's numbers that are public you know there are other youtubers that have like millions much more millions than me and their so their viewer count is much lower mm. so i think i'm more like i'm like a, a a YouTuber that people like to think is an asshole. So they don't want to give me that subscribe. They'll watch, but they just don't want to give me that. Like, eh, let me subscribe to this guy. Yeah. So it's like their little takeaway. Cause I know I do it. I know there are YouTubers that I like their content, but I think they're such an asshole. I just won't give them the subscribe. So I know there are people that think that of me. Is that why you haven't subscribed to my channel? Damn it. That's, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. Shit, no, so I, <laughs> there are so many times where, you know, like I met people, at shows uh, and even people from high school that are like, you know, when we were in high school together, I always thought you were an asshole, but now I realize that I was just my, it was my association of you because you're quiet. You know, I was always kind of very introverted and I'll meet people at shows and they'll be like, you know, I watched the first few videos, like who's this asshole showing off. And then I saw your vlog or I, saw, I heard you on a podcast or, and then I realized, you know, you just, this is just your style. And, mm. and I really appreciate what you do now. And now I watch everything with a different point of view. I mean, I've heard that umpteen times. What's something you like doing that's got nothing to do with making? Um, I was going to say tinkering. Lately, I've been going for <laughs> that, that's making. Tinkering is like really a, a, one of the things I do the most. But um, I like doing yard work, you know, working around the house. I got 40 acres. I like doing some landscaping a little bit. I'm not good at it, but I like that kind of stuff. I've been going for long walks and bicycle rides. I do this thing where I go for like a long, long walk. I'll do like a five mile walk in my neighborhood up and down. I live in a very like rural area. So there's roads that go up and down and I'll do a certain loop where like, I know at the end is going to be this torturous walk up a hill you know, <laughs> just to, to challenge myself to see how many times I could do it in a week. So I like to do that. I like to go for long drives and explore. I always think it's really important to get input visual input and i just said this on the podcast where like i had to go to the jersey shore which is a 200 mile drive for me to go see my brother and my mom and my sister mm. just for a vacation week and i only went for a couple of days but you know i look at the whole scope of the ride the ride getting there seeing my family whatever we're going to do together and then the ride back like that whole thing for me is the vacation 
yeah we, not just, you're taking not just being on the way right because like mm-hmm. it doesn't that matter like you can see a street sign like oh that shape is cool you know like 100 percent. that's I never, exactly I, and that's then exactly experience and like three months later you're putting that shape into something you're just building in the shop right Cause, yeah and i love cars so when you go on the road like what do you see you see cars you know you see a million cars you you would ignore because they're not your style but then you see that one car you're like that's the car i need to buy that's the one you know <laughs> i need to buy a hearse <laughs> exactly <laughs> but, you know i always say that the the best inspiration comes from surprise surprise attacks and you, you're not going to surprise yourself staying home and alone you know you'll get a surprise attack inspiration being out and about yeah do you have a project that's completely priceless that you would never sell? Um, well, I, you know, I, I talk about this thing all the time. This uh, it's sitting right here. It's actually outside. Uh, this little, I, I, I don't want to sell anything to be honest with you. Like if I'd made it for YouTube, people are like, I want to buy that. I'm like, yeah, I'd rather keep it. If I make something with the intention of giving it away, like I just made this big uh, judge's gavel, I'm going to give to uh, Devin, who's a legal Eagle YouTuber. I made that for him. He's going to have that. Like my cannons that I've made. And, uh, you know, because I think it, like they're also like, for me, they're moments on the timeline of my artistic development where, oh, that was the thing where I learned these five in- incredible things that I'll never forget. Mm. So And so the very first thing that I did with that with is this, this seahorse that I made. And it's it's sitting inside. I made it when I was like seven years old. And I remember I made it when I was nine years old because it's 1976 I wrote on the back and I was nine years old in 76. And, and it says, uh, I made this, blah, blah, blah. And I made it on a piece of scrap. My dad used to make signs all the time. Yeah. And so <clears throat> he's as bad a speller as me. So he would hand, it was before CNC, of course. So he would hand router letters and stuff. And on the back uh, of the seahorse is like a misspelled thing that he did for some, somebody. So like he just turned to scrap wood. Yeah. So he gave it to me and I cut the seahorse out of it. So I love it because my dad's mistake is on the back and my discoveries on the front. Oh, that's interesting. Um, the last question, what does happiness look like? Uh, happiness is just having the, the mental freedom to just like wake up on a day and say, I have like these five projects, which one am I going to work on? There's no deadlines. Happiness is no deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> happiness is no deadlines. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, happiness is just, uh, you know, creative freedom to me. I, you know what? Those words, when, we, when you're just saying that, that those words, creative freedom, came were in my head just as you're saying that because yeah. that's i i always feel that that's part of like the happiness of you, you just have the freedom to create and there's no yeah. judgment there's no anything it's just yeah it's that's you. why i love laura that's why I like laura's videos are so attractive to so many because you could see she's just freedom she's just creating in freedom she's just doing what laura wants to do there's no you know even when she does uh, you know occasionally she does like a little branded video even that just Laura's style is, is Laura's style. And she just makes it seem like it's just creative freedom. Yeah. Well, I hope, uh, I hope I've convinced you and I hope Jimmy's convinced you more importantly to start saying yes to more things and be open to, <laughs> to opportunities that may arise. Um, so, that, you know, you guys can be the badass creators you were meant to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think if, this is the first time you've heard this podcast i i want to encourage you guys to go check out all the past episodes that were recorded last year in fact if you start at the beginning of this you'll see that nothing happens overnight um and you know the the evolution of this podcast has been really steep you know to to get to the style it is now yeah Uh, For those who have been listening for a while, uh, welcome back. I am going to try to do an episode every month, not every week, but every month. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, I think we're going to have some amazing guests uh, on this show. And uh, I want to say thank you for for Jimmy for coming on the show. You gave me the kick in the butt to get this thing going up again. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm (laughs) glad. I want to give uh, all my patrons a massive shout out, especially to my top tier heroes, Stian Suhus, Sylvester Arneson and Andreas Volman, and a massive shout out to 
uh, our new patron, Ryan Wilson. You guys are absolute legends and I could not actually do what I do without the support from you guys. And I really appreciate you guys being there for me. And um, if you would like to support this podcast and the shenanigans on my YouTube channel, Garage Avenger, please head over to Patreon and become part of the GA Nation. Um, get early access to podcast videos and the podcast after show where you get to uh, get your questions answered by our guest. Uh, today, I'm going to be asking Jimmy what he had for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, all my patrons get to also ask Jimmy a question. And uh, I encourage you guys to give me some feedback. Uh, if you want to do so, please send your DMs to at Garage Avenger on Instagram. Thank you, Jimmy, for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, bro. Thank you so much. It's I'm been just... great. You're very, you're very insightful. Uh, you have a, also a calming voice, which is... <laughs> and you met, you forgot to mention tall and handsome <laughs> tall and handsome of course <laughs> yes. uh until next time guys uh remember to say yes to igniting your creativity and say yes <laughs> to making your ideas reality keep pushing yourselves keep ballsing up things keep learning 100 percent. thank you get inspired and i will catch you on the flip side thank you thank brother Thanks, Jimmy. We're out, man. Appreciate the appreciate the time. Yeah, man. You know what I was gonna say, but we could do it now. Yeah. <clears throat> you should have every guest suggest the next guest you have on. Ooh. I was gonna suggest that. Who's my next guest then? You should you should talk to Eric from Hansel Rescue. I mean, I don't know if you get you made friends with Eric like when we were all there, right? Yeah, I'll, I yeah. met him, but I I, I don't I wouldn't say I made friends with him as such. Right. Yeah. I huh. yeah, all right. Well, I'm going to send him, a, I'll send him a DM and say, Jimmy dubbed you in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's such an interesting dude and he's got so much depth that like you don't know unless you scratch the surface with him.